Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Knowledge Cafe, where we'll carry on a discussion on what did heritage communities learn from the pandemic. Maybe using past tense here is not even correct. Better to say that what are the communities continuously learning from the pandemic? Uh, my name is Andrea Tunke. I'm working for the Metropolitan Research Institute in Budapest, and I am one of the coordinators of the Open Heritage Project. Uh, the innovation part of this project uh, is focusing on six so-called cooperative heritage labs where the project works together with a wide range of stakeholders, including residents, local businesses, education organizations, municipalities, and so on. And the main aim of the project is to develop business and financial models using bottom-up approaches. So obviously, this work was heavily affected by the lockdowns, social distancing rules, gathering restrictions, just to mention few of the most obvious consequences of the pandemic. The good news is that the operation of our labs continued despite of these difficulties. Moreover, they progressed uh, significantly. For me personally, this is just another proof that people always respond to constraints with creativity, always. So I am very happy to say that five out of six of our labs are here with us now, today, ready to share their experiences. So please, everyone, join us. Dora Merei from Budapest. Luz Feldhaus from England, Dominika Brodovic from Poland, Rolf Novihuy and Christian Dar from Germany, Alessandro Piperno from Italy, and we also have here Lukács Hayes, who is helping me today with moderating this session. Hello, good to see you all, and thank you very much for contributing to this session. So what we can say in general is that this period is about surviving and adapting. The difficulties are more or less similar everywhere. However, the measures taken always depend on the local circumstances. So before jumping into the discussion, let me ask you to briefly summarize uh, the sites you are working on, trying to focus on their special features. Uh, while you are speaking, we'll show some pictures of the labs, uh, just to have a better sense of where we are virtually. So first, let me ask Alessandro Piperno from Luis University to introduce us uh, the Rome um, Collaborati Collaboratory <laughs> uh, Lab. The floor is yours, Alessandro. Thank you, Andrea, and welcome, everyone. Um, so the Long Collaboratory is an area-based project, so we do not focus on specific heritage artifacts, but more on an area, uh, consistently the ICT uh, district, which is an acronym of three neighbors, Alessandrino, Centocelle, and Torres Paccata, which are in the southeast part uh, of the city. At uh, the center of these three districts, there is the Park Archaeological di Centocelle, Archaeological Park of Centocelle, and many other historical um, artifacts and values. Uh, what we would like to promote is not the um, regeneration of a single uh, monument, but more uh, the acknowledgement of the values, tangible and intangible, that are within the area. Um, this is also allowed uh, the company to become the first uh, heritage community recognized by the Tower Convention Network in Rome. Um, as we promote uh, inclusive and democratic approach to the valorization of the district. Um, now, currently, we are working also to create uh, new values um, and new artifacts. Uh, thanks also to the Living Memory Exhibition uh, promoted by the Open Heritage Project. Thank you very much, Alessandro. And now let's move to a rural site in Hungary, which will be presented by Dora Merai, who teaches and does research in the Cultural Heritage Studies program of the CEU. Please, 
Nora. A Pomász Nagykovácsi puszta is a complex archaeological environmental heritage site situated on the edge of Pomász, a small town which is 20 km north from Budapest, the capital. The site used to be a manorial complex of a nearby Cistercian monastery in the Middle Ages, which was specialized on glass production. Now it displays partly excavated ruins of the former church and manorial buildings, as well as traces of historical land use and water system, systems, including medieval fish ponds. It is located in the territory of a biofarm in private ownership, and the owner of the farm is interested in the heritage side, but the preservation and accessibility can only be secured by developing the necessary physical, social and financial infrastructure. And uh, this, all of these are also needed uh, in order to have the community, the local and broader community to benefit from the heritage side. So this requires the involvement of a broader range of stakeholders and the integration of the site into the chain of similar sites into the region, which is a mountainous uh, region, forested region, uh, popular for uh, those searching for recreation. The biofarm is not sustainable yet as an enterprise, and it cannot secure the financial uh, resources, so the site should generate at least a part of the necessary resources. So. Uh, for all these, the physical environment of the site needs to be developed in a certain extent. The social embeddedness of the site should be increased uh, to have a community taking care of it. And uh, so a community needs to be created around the site. And uh, there are various uh, groups who have already been interested in the site for a while now, local inhabitants, uh, then there is a supportive community in higher education, including Central European University, so our university, uh, because the site has been used as an educational site. And uh, the third group consists of the visitors of the region, hikers, bikers, religious pilgrims, uh, and those who are attracted by the farm uh, due to the gastronomic offer. Uh, so the, our vision of the uh, Pomaz Nagykovácsi Pusta lab is um, that it is a meeting point of various groups of people, various heritage communities, who value different aspects of the site and who share these values with each other while relaxing, having new experiences and establishing new social contacts in a so-called safe uh, environment, uh, which means that it's com comfortable and, and uh, natural and uh, generally beautiful. So the mission of the lab for, for the project period is to turn uh, this complex environmental and cultural heritage site into an accessible place for these various groups uh, who are attracted by the values and uh, cooperating the, in the interpretation and presentation of the site with these groups in a way that uh, it contributes also to the sustainability of the uh, farm where it's located. Thank you very much, Dora. And now we jump to England, to a site in Sunderland with a totally different character, including buildings and renovation works, and where the open heritage activities are embedded in a long-term large-scale project started long before Open Heritage. Uh, we will hear the details from Luz Velpaus, lecturer at Newcastle University. Uh, good morning, Andrea and all, and, and thank you for the introduction. Yes, these um, three previously quite dilapidated buildings, as you will see in the pictures, uh, really played an important role in uh, the urban history of Sunderland, which is a post-industrial city in the northeast of England. Um, they were built as merchant houses in the late 1700s, and a few years after they were built, they were turned from houses into shops and offices because the street they were on became the high street and the sort of commercial heart of the town. But this heart then also moved away again from there, moved east, um, uh, moved west, apologies, and this led to a, to a gradual degradation of this site. Um, Skipping to, to now, after being left vacant for and in disrepair for at least two decades, uh, the buildings were obtained by Sunderland City Council. You can see what they looked like um, in 2018, and they were gifted to the Tyner Ware Building Preservation Trust. And this trust is also a partner in the Living Lab and also a partner in Open Heritage. 
So the current uh, gradual renovation of the site is led by the Tyne Aware Building Preservation Trust and is undertaken in collaboration with us, Newcastle University, in this living lab, but more importantly with various local stakeholders as it is one of the projects in what we call the Sunderland Historic High Streets Heritage Action Zone which is the result of a historic England-led national initiative uh, to focus on heritage resources in underprivileged places. So the Tyne Rare Building Preservation Trust is a regional trust specializing in difficult restoration projects. Uh, the aim is to develop viable futures for buildings through restoration and thus to develop new uses, create mutual benefit in doing buildings up and provide accessible space for, for a variety of users. Um, this means tending to the material, but also, of course, stimulating and facilitating and weaving a self-sustaining network of care to secure future maintenance and use. And the work, therefore, involves obtaining planning permissions and funding and overseeing construction and restoration works as much as it does collaborating with future tenants, current tenants, users, wider networks of organizations, uh, small businesses, artists, neighborhood organizations, funders, local government, but also creating links with other building spaces and projects in the city. And after three years uh, of multiple struggles, I have to say we are now incredibly proud to be very near uh, reopening the group of buildings. And we are working towards adding a fourth and maybe a fifth building into the mix. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louis. Uh, the next site is situated in Germany and it is a very interesting co-housing project. Similarly to Sunderland, the big project here also started before Open Heritage and our project is focusing only on some aspects of the big picture. Uh, the case will be presented by Christian Da, research, a research consultant at the non-profit foundation Stiftung Trias. Yeah. Um, Hof Prediko is one of the largest um, four-sided farmyards in the federal state of Brandenburg in Germany. The village uh, Prediko is about 60 kilometers northeast of Berlin. The site became um, abandoned after the German reunification. And in 2015, a group of people um, discovered the Hof Prediko site and decided to wake up the place from its uh, Sleeping Beauty sleep. Um, the site offers more than 2,400 2, square uh, meters space within the buildings and several hectares of land. So the process has to be continued even after the Open Heritage um, project and could take up to 10 years. So the group contacted our foundation in order to get help and support. We helped them searching for funding, choosing the right legal form and securing the land from speculation. Our foundation bought the land and we formed um, a heritable building right. We involved a partner, the Mietergenossenschaft Selbstbau, um, a cooperative which is situated in Berlin. The Selbstbau Cooperative is the ground lease holder. The group established a legal form and association and became tenants of the buildings. Open Heritage supported the group process, for example, by funding of moderated workshops. These workshops helped the group um, to figure out the best usage models and the um, implementation of the renovation process for the first buildings. These group processes have been mostly personal meetings, which had to be stopped by the COVID pandemic. The group switched to online meetings. They became very innovative and implemented a number of online tools in order to continue working on the process. These processes have uh, were almost finished and the renovation of the first buildings hasn't been affected largely in the, in 2020 by the pandemic. The renovation of the most important building, a former barn that had been converted into a village community center, has been finished in August 21. Also the first apartments and flats are ready and people moved in. These steps are really important for the group because some of them have been working for years um, on the project, living in trailers on the site, and it is deeply human the way, yeah, it is important, a, a way uh, is important, but reaching a goal is also necessary. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christian. Our virtual tour ends in Warsaw's Praga district, which will be presented by Dominika Brodovic, uh, assistant professor at Warsaw School of Economics.
Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, I will be talking to, uh, today about the Praga district and actually about the Praga lab itself. Uh, in Praga lab, we work as a part of the OVUSARP, which is the uh, Warsaw branch of, um, of Polish Architects uh, Association. And we focused uh, in our work uh, uh, on a district which is on the right uh, right side uh, of the Vistula River on the right bank. For many, many years, uh, or uh, actually centuries, it was an industrial site uh, known for a, a very uh, flourishing work, uh, blue collar uh, workers. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, with the economic transformation, everything has changed. Some, some uh, workplaces became obsolete. Some of the factories uh, became basically empty and not used anymore. So uh, the district was deteriorating for, for many, many uh, decades. Um, but currently the situation is changing very dynamically. First of all, because the, of the um, large regeneration scheme uh, for this district. Another thing was opening the second uh, subway line. And of course, with the subway and new investment funds from mostly from the EU, uh, large uh, investors, uh, capital investors came in with housing developments. And that's, uh, you know, that was the environment we stepped in. So there was, uh, there were already many programs and also numerous uh, NGOs, uh, but no one was talking actually, uh, was talking actually about uh, the heritage and how to reuse it, but uh, in a proper manner and how to involve the community. Uh, using the pillars, people, places, and potential, uh, which are you know, the, the main pillars of the uh, Open Heritage Project, uh, we figure out that uh, we need to focus on, on three actions, which are actually to map, to uh, provide, and then to promote. What does it mean to map? First of all, we focused on the area, and we wanted to see how many, uh, how many sites and what kind of uh, communities uh, actually are involved uh, in adaptive heritage or at least uh, you know in the heritage of the area and um, results of our work will be uh, will be presented to fun, uh, soon on our website uh, the second part was to provide and then we focused on people uh, making an open call for small and micro entrepreneurs which was called made in praga and also we focus on sites. Here you will see a picture of the bakery, which is a beautiful building from the early uh, 20th century. And it was used as a bakery uh, almost like, uh, let's say 15, year, uh, 15 years ago. But unfortunately, again, because it's a difficult building, beautiful site, but still a difficult building, um, needed modernization. Um, not, many, uh, not many tenants are interested. So we decided to open a call for a workshop together with, uh, with the uh, branch of, uh, with OVUSARP and figure out like how to use uh, sites like the bakery for uh, the community, what could be done and uh, what kind of funding actually the micro and small entrepreneurs can use to be, uh, to be able to work in such a places. So not only uh, focusing on large investors, but also opening uh, sites like the bakery uh, for the communities. Of course, we couldn't do it alone. So that's why we created a rather broad, but a very close net uh, of stakeholders. Uh, and looking at our community, of course, it's the city. So we invited uh, to cooperation. Uh, the architect of the city of Warsaw, the vice president of Warsaw, who is responsible for planning and architecture, uh, also uh, departments uh, which are involved uh, in protection of heritage, and what is the most important, numerous organizations and numerous individuals who are already working daily uh, in Praga and uh, who are focusing on preserving the heritage, not only tangible, but also intangible, because Praga is much more than buildings. It also is also about the people, the culture, the way they live over there, the way they communicate, the special language they have. I wouldn't call it slang, but it's a very special language and the attitude they have and the way they cooperate, because you wouldn't find any other place in, in Warsaw, which is such a, which is so vibrant and open for newcomers and also for people who already who are already there. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Dominica, and thanks for all of you for this short presentation. Uh, I really hope that uh, they brought the audience a little bit closer to the site and uh, helped them to have some insights about the character, the different character of the sites we are working on. And now, before the first round of, uh, of the discussion, we would like to play a short video montage for you uh, that we cut from footage that was taken before the pandemic and where some of the actors of the project talk about the original goals uh, and objectives of Open Heritage. We work on sites where not much money flows in. So no one would travel to Hungary or to Poland or to Germany for this but that provide the backbone of the community and that's also heritage and especially important socially and for me as a sociologist heritage is not only a value in itself but also a tool that i see that helps to improve communities help helps to build them and helps to regenerate them it's entitled open heritage but it wants to mean that open we are open to involve communities and people and we op open regarding the definition of what constitutes, what constitutes heritage. The main goal is to try to come up with a solution that creates, um, that helps local communities to take control of their heritage site and to find an appropriate reuse for them. Most important in the lab sites, but also in the observatory sites, we can energize thinking and local community life, and this um, thinking can live on. We are not talking about only the empty shells of the buildings or uh, open spaces, but we are talking about the people and their traditions, their expectations and their identity. Collaboration within cities is essential to get communities being part of the process. So we're working on collaborations between municipalities, businesses and communities and how to work on heritage within European cities. How citizen initiatives can influence the way we design cities and the way we decide about what the use of the building that needs to be renovated should be. So that's basically where participatory platforms are an impressive tool. It's just about like creating engagement with citizens. If we are able to introduce it into our normal life, this is the best way to deal with difficult heritage. Heritage doesn't exist without heritage community, without people who see buildings and walls and places as something very important for them, as part of their identity. We think that the open heritage can be a very important tool to build more sustainable communities and preserve the tangible and intangible heritage in our cities. All right, so we heard many interesting things here. But uh, the most interesting for me was the thing that Katarzyna Selwin from the Praga Lab mentioned that uh, the best way to deal with difficult heritage is to introduce it to our normal life. The question today is what is normal life now? How did our normal life, uh, how, how has our normal life changed? It was also mentioned that Open Heritage would like to energize thinking and local uh, community life. But how? How can we do it under these uh, difficult circumstances? Uh, obviously, we need to embrace citizen initiatives. But again, how? So in the first round of discussion, I would like you to reflect on these hows. How was the original project objective in danger during the pandemic? And what measures did you take to minimize the negative consequences? And uh, as I already mentioned, the Prague Lab, I would like to ask you, Dominika, to react first on these questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Andrea, for this question. Well, actually, I have to tell you that, you know, when, of course, when the pand pandemic stroke and lockdowns appeared, we were, uh, we were like, firstly frightened. First of all, what's going to happen with the lab? And then with our community, will people uh, will be willing to cooperate still? But uh, very fast, we find out that even though the, the life just switched to online, 
people were still interested in co cooperation and the topics that we uh, we were focusing on um you know we, basically we we uh, we didn't skip uh, like any of the objectives that we had we just had to adjust and that's what i would call the last two years will will basically adjust and then act but not to you know not to, uh, to talk very broadly uh, let me give you just two examples uh, when we started the bakery uh, uh, process, it was November 2019, so everything looked perfect. We created a large community. Uh, we had the first workshop in January, and thank God, because that's how, you know, that's how it glued the community for us. And then we switched online. It was so much easier because people already knew each other, and they were already committed. And when we had the vice president and also the architect of the city, it looked very, uh, you know, very serious for everyone. So we carried on with uh, with the number of online meetings, and when it was possible and safe, we we were also meeting uh, face to face using the garden of our organization, the building of uh, of our organization. But not everything was, you know, so very like pink and colored. Uh, when we were working on bakery, there was an open core for for a new tenant, and we were very excited because the you know new tenant came in. She had the brilliant ideas what to do with the bakery, how to open it for the community, how she will uh, start workshops and co uh, cooperating with everyone. But unfortunately, the bakery is in such a bad technical condition that first of all, uh, it needed modernization. And since uh, the new tenant couldn't uh, act over there and she couldn't start any kind of economic activity, it was impossible to her to make a commitment uh, and invest also in modernization. So she withdrew within 12 months since the pandemic started, she withdrew from, the, uh, from her tenant uh, agreement. And once again, uh, bakery is, uh, is the, you know, empty. So that's how we figure out the new project, which is called the Bakery 2. And right now we are, uh, we are searching for practical tools for any possible new tenant, micro and small, who would be willing to come to the bakery and work over there, but not to be alone. Because the biggest problem is uh, when you, even though you are enthusiastic, you cannot handle such big projects when you are a small entrepreneur and you feel that you are alone. Alone meaning you don't know the tools, you don't know where to search for additional funds, and also you don't feel enough support from the uh, legal departments. In case of bakery, it is, uh, it is city owned, and then it's managed by the special department, managing department uh, in Praga district. And what we want everyone is just to come into the table and create a private partnership, a private, private public partnership um, model to cooperate in such a situation. Another story was our, uh, was our uh, Made in Praga uh, contest, which, which we had for micro and small entrepreneurs. And we learned a lot from this project, actually, uh, because we work with three types of entrepreneurs in Made in Praga and everyone was struck by COVID in very different, uh, very different way. One of our uh, Made in Praga cooperatives uh, unfortunately stopped uh, her activity and she had to switch to her previous job, which was a project manager. Right now we are helping her to come back to the market, you know, to be an artist again. With the second one uh, who was, uh, uh, she was creating lamps in Praga, but since the lockdown was, you know, was prolonged, she figured out it will be easier for her and more, um, I would say, uh, a better atmosphere will be if she will come back to her small uh, town and then she will have like her craft work, uh, craft, uh, work uh, done over there where, where she had her home and you know the whole base and, and the support of the family. And uh, with the third group, uh, there were entrepreneurs and also um, oh, shop owners, they quickly switched online, so it shows that in the pandemic, how important it is to, first of all, to have an idea what to do with yourself, and secondly, to have a local support, and, and of course, uh, the business idea, because even though we love Praga, like everyone who cooperates with us, you know, this ec economic side could be very harsh, and in, uh, you know, in the end, everyone is looking like how to pay the rent, 
and what is for them feasible and what makes for them the financial sense, you know, to be still in the area. But uh, as I said before, we learned a lot um, and we are happy that everyone is so open to talk about not only, you know, the success stories, but also about the problems. And they are also willing to, to take the lessons learned and, and to share them. Thank you, Dominica. I would like to encourage everybody to use the chat box for posting questions for our panelists. And also, let me ask you, uh, the other lags, if you have any questions to Dominica, any reflections to share, similarities, same problems. Uh, so, Prague Lab is working. Uh, uh, working very closely with SMEs and entrepreneurs that go uh, went bankrupt and have serious economic difficulties. Uh, Pomas has a private owner. I don't know, Dora, if you had similar difficulties or how did you survive this this uh, period period which was uh, hard not only because of the communication and things like that, but also from an economic point of view. Well, I think this term survived is uh, maybe it's not even uh, doesn't even describe the situation well because the it's it's a it's I think it's a permanently changed situation. So uh, I think we are we are not surviving but rather adapting, and this is still in progress. Uh, Pumas is is in a. It's a very different site from Praga. This is a small town in rural Hungary, and the site itself is outside the town. And uh, so we are working with a small community. And uh, as I mentioned before, our main uh, aims were to, or still are, to open up the site, so to make it accessible and to turn it into a meeting point. Now, these two things became impossible uh, in the first period of uh, COVID because of the lockdown and health risks, health-related risks. So um, as soon as we started uh, our community activities, uh, the site had to be closed. And there was even a period when Poma settlement uh, closed down all the hiking trails in this mountains region as well. So uh, though it seemed to be a good idea for families uh, from Budapest like us to get out uh, for, for, from the lockdown and to have some fresh air, these uh, trails are generally so populated over the weekend and there were so many people who had this brilliant idea that it became a, a hazard. Uh, so. Uh, Though it seems to be a, a good opportunity that we are outside the city, in practice, uh, the lockdown affected also the openness of uh, this area and specifically the site. Uh, and so we thought about this, that what can we do? And uh, what we did is we focused on uh, bringing together actors, stakeholders, and uh, strengthening and supporting uh, the community building process. And we did this by uh, cooperating with the municipality, and we were very lucky because there were local elections and the new, new local leadership was elected, uh, which was uh, set up by local civic organizations, so very much civic-minded people. And uh, this new leadership, they were very, municipal leadership, they were very open for cooperation. And uh, they initiated the establishment of a, of a value, heritage value repository of, or inventory of POMAS uh, to ask people what they perceive as local heritage and to create a, a heritage inventory based on this. And we, uh, together with the local NGO, we, the lab, uh, created an online forum for this purpose. And people started to submit and uh, vote about uh, various heritage items, including our site, lab site, of course, it's in the heritage inventory, but also like a special type of uh, fruit which is produced in Pomas or, or people uh, with the 
significant achievements who are from pomas or or other uh, like some traditions so tangible and intangible values so uh, we based on this uh, a group formed who are interested and invested in local heritage and also in cooperation with uh, various uh, civic initiatives we uh, organized a series of online events with invited guests, lectures, discussions on uh, local history, local heritage, including our site. So uh, when this hard lockdown eased, there was already a group of uh, people who, who, who were in a discourse, in a discussion about heritage. And uh, this uh, discussion could be continued or can be continued on the site still it's uh, with uh, moderate intensity but we already had some uh, activities with volunteers uh, also contributing to the development of the site like uh, uh, there was a community oven built and uh, it was already tried so there was some community event with proper uh, covid related uh, measures I mean, preventive measures uh, when uh, people baked something nice and ate it and had a good discussion. So uh, I don't, I don't think that this uh, period of the lockdown and pandemic, like this difficult periods of the pandemic, were wasted, but definitely changed uh, how we think about the lab. And uh, and I think this change will will stay with us. So I don't think that that uh, that we can get back to the old normal, which is okay because I think this lab, this site can help people uh, adapt to the new conditions uh, by being a meeting point and uh, fresh air and it's open space. So it's a bit easier in terms of uh, the pandemic, um, like this. That's dangerous than cold spaces. So besides the pandemic, you had to face another difficulty that the driving force of the activity, the CEU moved to Vienna. So could you use this period to start to develop a new business model for the lab? Uh, well, we, we, we actually we had a discussion with Rolf and uh, the other members of the financial task force uh, like yesterday, uh, two days ago, about uh, the sustainable uh, business model of, of this site. And, uh, and uh, well, there, it, it's a very specific situation in Hungary Hungary is not unique in this respect that that it's really difficult to find resources for such small heritage sites and and specifically for civic initiatives. So uh, what is a very valuable and important resource is uh, the local volunteers work. And uh, for example, uh, building materials to reuse. So where where this whole uh, uh, idea switched or the practice switched is this do-it-yourself and environment-friendly methods of recycling, reusing materials. And this is also a new discourse that evolved around the site uh, used to, to this. So I, I really believe that that uh, a weakness could be turned into an opportunity or an asset in this respect. But it's a very slow and small scale step-by-step -step, uh, development. Uh, and uh, so we, we also had to rethink uh, how we see the site in this respect. And uh, it's very different from the Praga lab in, in this respect to that, that uh, it's, it's probably not going to be, uh, not going to produce large lab revenues, but uh, more like uh, work with uh, various type of types of uh, resources and and this uh, human uh, element human resource volunteer work uh, which contributes to the community building might be the most important uh, one i don't know uh, maybe roth can uh, add later something on this uh, yeah i can only confirm you 
with what you just said. I think you are a good example of a small scale business model uh, <coughs> working with uh, material you have, a small budget and volunteer work, and that's it. I think uh, it's not only, as you said, it's not only bad, it's really a chance because you need a lot of engaged people and you may stay, may stay for, for this for a couple of years and maybe if general political situation changes and you get more support and more funds, um, you may come to a, to a different um, level and, and being able to, to invest more money. And I remember that yesterday you said, without investment, we, we, we are not able to earn money and, and to generate income. So, um, well, such a project has to be patient and work on the level it can work. So I think it's okay and it, it, it shows, shows chances. Yeah, that's it. If you don't want to add anything to Dominica and, and Dora, I would like to turn uh, uh, to two other sites now where the construction works are very important. And we hear a lot that uh, uh, there are big difficulties uh, in the, with the supply chain issues, with uh, increasing prices for building materials, delivery time becomes longer, less predictable. So how did all these things affect the work in Sunderland and uh, Hofpredico? Luz, please, if you can start and let yeah, of course. Yeah, actually, it was interesting to hear Dominica uh, say that um, that because they still had the garden and they could sometimes maybe meet when the lockdown was less strict and stuff. And, but because we were, which is really good, right? Because then you can really get together. And I think in Sunland, what we what happened is that we were really just started. We just started the the whole um, construction period. So we just we get we had funds from various funders. To do the the main construction works so the site was a construction site and then because of COVID, it got locked down but also it became really impossible to access because of construction and COVID. and um, so we lost our space to meet with people and i think that kind of, having that space for whatever organization you are i think it's really important like the physical space where you can meet and you can have the moments where you actually you know interact and and decide um so and then we did move online of course and we and we could do some of this online but then at the same time we were still really very much building the community so that that kind of process of already having met the big group wasn't really there so it that that made it quite um but yeah so we really lost the momentum on that side in the way that we couldn't use the buildings and then we couldn't really do this the things we really wanted to do uh, the construction was very heavily um, delayed because of all of it, because people weren't allowed on site and we couldn't work there and all this kind of stuff. But then at the same time, actually, it was also interesting to see that it that it gave us some new opportunities, right? That we all of a sudden uh, had access to some new types of funding that were kind of like the COVID um, response funding um, that we that we were able to benefit from also. So the organizations we were working with, it was very much a survival mode um, uh, situation but then they were able to have access to some of these funds and that made it a little bit easier uh, for them to sort of like you know to focus on the future so that meant they had some money now to survive and to also think about like okay how are we going to ad adapt and adjust and how are we going to do this future thing because one of the buildings is going to be a music venue you can imagine that they got quite worried about like, okay, how are we going to do this in the future, right? It's like, it's a music venue. Can we still do the same numbers? We really build our business model on like having a certain amount of people buying, you know, buying tickets and, and buying uh, drinks and stuff. So can we, can we still do this if we all have to distance? So to, to have space and time to really think about these future possibilities and, and new business ideas, uh, that was really good to have a bit of, um, yeah space within in the project um i guess i mean a lot of things didn't happen because of covid but all these projects are like this right a lot of things don't happen and then other things all of a sudden do happen and so in many ways this isn't much different from from normal but it is of course because a lot of things were just blocked so yeah that was that was frustrating 
Um, and really, yeah, I'm just very proud of all the people involved that they survived and that we managed, you know, to get this far. Um, and hope, yeah, going to open soon. Thank you. And then let me ask Christian that how did the community and Hof Predico adapt to this new situation and new difficulties? I think Rolf, this is your. Yeah, I, I would would like to to show the the different levels of um, COVID um, yeah affection on 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 the whole lab. I mean, we had to cope with it within the, in the foundation, which functions quite well, um, because we we had the possibility to make home offices. Um, the, the cooperative in in Berlin did the same. And uh, even on long distance, um, it has been able to, yeah, to keep the connection and the, the cooperation between all partners. I think the, the the biggest challenge was within the group on Hof Predico, the association, the the stakeholders and activists uh, on the site, and um, well, due to the fact that they have uh, quite elaborated. Um, communication system on on it level they were able to uh to manage this quite well and of course as lou said we have the place we have the site so it's not only a garden it's a, a huge um uh well uh yard within the buildings you can meet or you have empty um empty buildings so it, it has always been able to to communicate and to have exchange uh, so, to be honest, COVID wasn't that problem. And uh, even with building materials, as you said, Andrea, um, the cooperative is, is quite experienced in, in building processes. And as far as I know, they, they manage quite well. And um, as Christian already said, we um, the barn is uh, completed. And the first um, renters moved into the Schweizer house, as we call it, uh, the most beautiful building on the site, I'd say. Um, so yeah, COVID really wasn't that problem. We, we yeah, managed this phase quite well. <laughs> uh, may, may I ask a, a question to Luz? Um, how do you see the the, uh, the actual situation, the current situation? Uh, if you see Brexit, I mean, w the newspapers are full of problems uh, Great Britain is, is facing uh, right now. And uh, the situation in Sunderland, I mean, it's not a very rich city and you renovated the buildings, you need rent, you need income. Uh, so perspectives are a bit, yeah, with dark clouds or how would you describe it? <laughs> mm, yes and no. Of course, Brexit is going to influence all of this in ways that we don't, you know, we can see happening, but equally we don't really know how it plays out on the ground in specific situations, right? And I think, I mean, definitely because uh, the music industry is one of the industries that was really worried about like the, the impacts of Brexit and, and especially, of course, artists traveling because you can't have a gig if you don't have an artist actually coming there and we don't know yet still how this is going to be resolved and if this is like you know uh, if if it how much it will impact but i think what is also good to see is that they have diversified really um their sort of like business offer to kind of make sure that this is the impact of this if it, if, if it will be there is is a bit different and a bit less i hope so you know they were they are also now with a coffee shop um they are starting a pizza uh business so they are kind of, you know, there is kind of like a more local business model, which relies on people buying coffees and pizzas and, and this kind of stuff in, in relation to the, the more international business model, I suppose, of, of having a music uh, venue. And I think what is, I mean, Sunderland is definitely a, 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 not a very rich city and, it, and it, it may struggle as a result of Brexit and, and general austerity. Um, but equally, I think it's, it has quite a strong music industry, which is quite interesting. So there is a lot of collaboration within the city between different venues and between different organizations that all kind of like built this network that makes Sunderland an attractive city, I think, and to, to kind of do this in, to, to do this together. So hopefully, you know, the sort of like on the ground 
um, collaboration and, and solidarity is going to um, uh, maybe counter some of these Brexit effects. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to turn to Alessandro now because you were famous about your intensive outdoor community activities. So uh, how did everything continue in the pandemic, moving to indoor activities? Did you experience any lack of enthusiasm in the community? Okay. Um, at first, like, especially the Italian situation was particularly hard. Like we had so many constraints. I think we were the first one in Europe to got uh, locked down. Uh, so it was difficult. But at the very beginning, it was like surviving, as Dominica mentioned. Um, but there was this feeling, sure feeling, that uh, was something ex extraordinary happening. Uh, so in one sense, it was even better to uh, promote some activities, online workshops, uh, activities could reach many people that we couldn't before. Uh, so I think after this first phase, phase, we needed to adapt. So try to, as Dara mentioned, to create new activities that could still uh, foster enthusiasm among people. And we organized different workshops and people really participated and were involved in this also because they were home. So they were happy to be part of something new. And now I think this is the biggest challenge. We are in the phase of reinventing the models. Uh, so what we are trying to do now is trying to understand how new models could change the way uh, we used to do things. Uh, especially in our case, there are two main differences. The first one is trying to promote a new vision of local commerce and uh, local tourism. Um, especially tourism is changing a lot. We, in Rome, we were used to have thousands of thousands of people coming every day in the city that immediately stopped. Um, so we discovered the beauty of um, uh, visiting our neighborhoods. Uh, so the way people approach to discover the city really changed. We had a lot of national tourism, but also local one. So people living in the city, they were immediately trying to uh, understand more about their neighborhoods and their districts. So I believe that uh, COVID really changed uh, the paradigm of what we were doing, uh, but also had mm, the opportunity, like gave us the opportunity to change our model. Uh, so this is also why we are developing a platform, uh, Coroma, that enable people to communicate different levels. So from proposing um, a new project to selling uh, local uh, products. Uh, we cannot imagine the world uh, without in, uh, hybridizing the digital and the physical world. Uh, we cannot imagine the world without uh, finding a sustainable measurement, uh, sustainable mechanism to the activities, I think. Andrea, you I knew that this would happen. So uh, before we go to the second round of questions, I would like to turn to Lukács because an interesting discussion is going on parallelly in the chat box. So could you please sum up a little bit what's going on there? Yes. Uh, um, so I know like we we received two two questions uh uh regarding uh some of the the experiences during covid of the heritage labs and uh some of you have have answered uh in 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 the chat and also some of you already kind of uh, answered these questions uh in in person so i would just sum up uh things uh that appeared in the chat so um uh one one question re regarded whether uh, the Heritage Labs ob observed any kind of increased interest uh, in the heritage sites during the, the pandemic, uh, whether people rediscovered the, their, their neighborhoods more. And um, I mean, some of the, the questions were, were mixed. So some, some said yes uh, in the chat um, and then some uh, not so much. 
And then uh, the, the, the second question was regarding uh, special COVID funds, both uh, from the central government and, uh, and local, uh, local governments. You also, um, some of you already um, spoke about this uh, recently. Um, and in, in, in the chat, uh, some said, uh, yeah, already the construction has already started uh, by the time the COVID, uh, COVID came, so that so they didn't, uh, Christian uh, and their heritage lab didn't uh, use these funds. Um, and some other, uh, like Sunderland, for example, said that uh, they were able to um, access some of those funds. Uh, yeah. We need to end the session soon, but before that, I would like you to mention something that you consider a big achievement, something that you can take over from this difficult period, something that you are proud of. So in two, three sentences, very shortly. Uh, and let's start with uh, Dominica. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna uh, switch my mic on. Um, a lot of was uh, said about the local uh, community and also about the local uh, economy. And I think that the pandemic situation and all the lockdowns proved once again that if we we'll focus on specific district and help to improve the quality of life over there and uh, attach it, you know, with the heritage and also the, the local pride and also information and access to funds, we will be able to survive the COVID situation. And for us, as everyone said, firstly, was adapt or adjust and then act properly to the situation, not to like overdo the things, but to be able to see what is actually happening. And uh, I have to say that we are actually very proud that we were able to, to catch those weak signals happening in the lab and in the area. And we switched from uh, ideas to you know to focus only on a specific case then to try to uh, create the processes and models together with the city together with decision makers because they are also lost in this situation they are willing to support local economies and communities but still for everyone the situation is so new that we need to come together and that's the, uh, for, for me, that's the biggest lesson. If we want to act in the situations like lockdowns and COVID and other pandemics and other, you know, everything that will happen in the future, we need to work together. Dora? We, we are heritage specialists. And uh, when we entered this project, we started with the intention of uh, preserving and presenting this site. And uh, I think uh, one of the main uh, lessons, and actually I'm also proud of this because this is also what you asked, is that that uh, the road is not a, so not it's not always the straight road that is the uh, shortest because uh, this site uh, it it's, it needs to be embedded into how this community works and it's a small community they have their own priorities. Like, for example, during this pandemic times, uh, there is a guy who volunteer, is volunteer and who, who operates a cultural venue, another venue in the small town, and his house was burnt down. And then the entire community, they, they focused on helping financially and with work this person. And uh, on the short run, well, they are not focusing on our side. On the on the, in the bigger scheme, this is something that is beautiful, and uh, and also that that uh, this strengthens a community that that in the future can ensure the preservation and management not just of our side but all the heritage uh, of this uh, settlement or and and the area around. So I am actually I'm proud to be part of this. <laughs> Thank you. Luz? Yeah, all of the, I mean, you know, first of all, of course, uh, it's just amazing to see it's still opening despite all the, 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 the difficulties we, we saw on the way. 
um, and and just that you know these organizations survived and are still involved and and but I think um, as a separate element, what, it's also important to reflect on the role of of a project like Open Heritage and I think really the fact that we were um, there and we had and that created a bit of space in terms of time and someone you know with with time like someone like me or, or a colleague Miranda um, really. I mean, I'm not saying that is why we survived, right? But it really made things just a little bit easier because it means you have a bit of overcapacity in a way that you don't have in many projects. And I think that's also a really important element to highlight um, that I've learned from this project on a personal level. Yeah. Thank you, Rolf, Christian. Yep. Um, first of all, um, also for us, the community, um, it is so nice to see that the people from the project group and the village they are working together um, because we were very afraid um, at the, in the beginning that the people wouldn't accept the group um, on the site as part of the village but um, the village community barn shows really great that everybody says this is our site we see potential and they hope to establish not only in a, in a cafe, they also want to establish a shop again. And they are very proud of it and they are working hand in hand together. But also um, we are very proud that um, the site was one of the stations of the day of the architecture in the federal state of Brandenburg within this year. And they received an innovation prize of the federal state of Brandenburg. And they received another um, initiative award this year. So also um, a bigger audience um, is, yeah, is paying attention to what is happening there on the site. Great, congratulations. Alessandro? Yes, um, I'd just like to stress that I think after the pandemic crisis, we also discovered the importance of culture and heritage, like the power that this has in putting, like convincing people to work together and let them collaborate. And um, I think the things that we are proud of the most is that we were able to create an event with uh, organized by local people with local artists of uh, like last September. And it was like kind of um, um, a proof, the proof that we are back uh, that uh, we survived the COVID and we can start again uh, some activities to valorize the values and the heritage uh, artifacts around the district. Thank you very, very much for your very precious contribution to this session. I think it was extremely interesting. The challenges are not over. Some of them might be overcome in the near future, but some of them will stay with us for a longer time. And we need to learn how to coexist with them. And it's a long learning process. So thank you once again. And I think we are ready to close the session. <laughs>